I, to a certain extent, I kind of feel like you're here because you agree with me that history's cool. Um, and it really is. And there is a lot of history out there, and there are a lot of people who are interested in various aspects of history, whether it's in film or video games or just people who are interested in studying various aspects of history. And those are things I think you can leverage to make a good model. Um, it's, it's just, it's cool. Second, um, accessibility. Let's face it, designing a large world is hard work. And one of the things I found very challenging when designing an original art, and I know a lot of people play in large where there's a custom built setting that uh, doesn't correspond directly to historical reality. You have to do a lot of heavy lifting in the background just to create the society. And then you have to convey all that information to your players so that they know that, you know, Hoffman V was, you know, king 50 years ago and there was a great big civil war. And, but if you set those things in a historically accurate time, if you locate your game in some way, shape, or form in history, that work's already been done for you. People have sometimes literally planned to get that work done for you. And oftentimes you can then count on some greater degree of familiarity from your players. You know, it's like, well, you don't have to say, well, he's kind of like sort of Henry VIII, yeah, and that, that's Henry VIII. And that is going to create certain resonances, certain historical recognitions that you can then play off and, and take advantage of. You also have to be cautious in that regard. There are some other pitfalls from doing that that I think I'll talk about in a minute. And thirdly, you know, you're know, you not reinventing the wheel. Uh, a lot of things have already been done through history that you can use. Again, you don't have to do all this stuff. And finally, reliability. When you are creating systems in your game, you kind of want to make sure, that, well, what are the customs of this society? Does that make sense and will it hold up to player scrutiny? I think that sometimes when you do something historically and apply that to a lot, it will hold up because it has held up. Historically, we have people do, we know people will react this way to this thing. So you're not creating something that doesn't really make sense. It's, again, the work has been done for you. There's huge, vast amounts of resources out there that are waiting for you to use. Um, now, what are some of the pitfalls? This is not, you know, it's like, and that's the end of my talk. Go out and do great things and use history. It's, no. There are problems as well, and I've encountered a lot of these in the course of designing Mars. The first one is uh, potentially problematic cultural values and norms, player intimidation, and player enthusiasm sometimes as well can be something you need to deal with. Let's talk a little bit first about player intimidation. As a general rule, it's probably safe to say that if you want to run a large set of a particular historical time period, it's because you love that historical time period and that you know a lot about that historical time period. And it is probably going to be the case with a significant number of your players that you know a lot more about it than they do. And they're going to know the same thing. And so they're going to say, well, I want to set a LARP in one LARP that I ran with my wife, Cynthia, was a murder mystery LARP in which we tried to figure out what happened to the two historical princes in the tower who were killed, supposedly, by Richard III, and the game was set early in the reign of Henry VII, his successor. And one of the things the king wanted to find out was what had actually happened to his two erstwhile kinsmen. And we did a lot of historical research behind the scenes. We figured out that the matter is nobody knows. If anybody tells you they know what happened to those two princes, they are selling you a book. <laughs> or, a, or, a, or a movie, or a website, or something. They're trying to sell you something. Nobody knows. But there are clues that you can use to come up with your best guess, and you can make a good argument one way or another. And that's why there's so many books about the thing. Because no one says, I have here the letter, which actually, <laughs> that thing doesn't exist. So we came up with what we thought was a plausible solution that fit well with the other things we wanted to do in the game. We said, in this reality, this is what happens. And then we gave that out to the players. The players said, well, I don't really know a lot about early Tudor England. How, how am I supposed to play the Duke of Norfolk? How am I supposed to play the Earl of Buckingham? How am I supposed to play some of these people? What if I want to play this other type of person? 
And so, and so one of the one of the things that you face is how about how do you communicate that historical knowledge to the players in a way that isn't going to be overwhelming for them and isn't going to turn them off by thinking, I don't know enough about this period of history to actually play in this game. And that's the last thing you want, is to have players feel like there's some sort of test as a bar for entry. Costuming is another big issue that um, I can talk about. Not everyone has the same access to or resources for or ability to get really awesome historically accurate costuming. There are some people who do, and when that happens, it's amazing. But that can be another pitfall for players is to say, gee, I mean, I just don't have anything that looks awesome, and I don't want to be that guy. You know, we were just talking about this before you can be that person who doesn't look awesome. How do you get yourself to the point where you can convince players that you can come in, what resources can you give them? And the, the fear that they're not going to look as good as everyone else is something that is going to And there are other problems as well. I, I don't know enough about that. I, how do I speak properly? What slangs do I use? So a myriad of questions that comes up, and that can be a problem you have to overcome. I'm going to talk about how to do that in the next session. So. Um, there's also the idea of player enthusiasm. The fact that there are, there's a lot of sort of pop culture support for history can be a blessing and a curse. As a historian, it's, I love um, the fact that there's such great stuff involved with history, but sometimes, I gotta tell you, <clears throat> sitting in that movie theater and they show a scene where they're, the printing press is churning out the wanted posters for Robin Hood, and I just, no! <laughs> you know, uh, just like, dip, 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 dip. no! You know, a friend of mine gave me uh, a DVD box set of uh, the, the Tudors, and I think we got through half of the first. We didn't get, we got through 50 minutes, so we, we, we said, what? 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 Often enough, it was like, oh god. No, we just turned it off. Um, so, Sometimes players will come in and you kind of have to and say, well, I want to do this, and you kind of say, well, that's not actually how it happens. So while some, sometimes popular culture has done the work for you in giving people a sense of familiarity with it, sometimes it's working against you by creating expectations that aren't really there. Oftentimes, also, players will want to play exceptional historical figures. I want to play this very, very strange outlier from the social norms of the time. And if everybody's playing that outlier, nobody is an outlier anymore. So how is it that you sort of guide players to sort of, you know, keep the number of outliers to the point where they actually are exceptional and everyone isn't, you know, someone who is unusual in history, unless it's a setting where everyone is supposed to be somewhat unusual. And then, of course, potentially problematic values and norms. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that there's a lot of ugliness in the past. And one of the questions that you all can definitely need to consider if you're going to set a lot in a historical time period is how much of that or do you want to confront in your life? Um, how much of it do you want to set aside? And that is a balance that you always have to strike. Um, so part of the problem is some players are really excited about embracing some of those tensions. Um, I played in a lot once that was set in the recent period when my friends who South Asian was playing a representative from one of the uh, South Asian principalities that had business with the East India Company. And he approached me between games that he was frustrated that everybody was treating him so nice. It's 1814! I'm brown! Come on! And so, can you do something? He asked me at the next game to say something. They were, I'm like, okay. okay. And he's like, yes, yes, please do it. And I did, and he went, oh. And he was like, 
because he wanted to have some of that tension. That was something he was interested in dealing with as a character, and he was struggling with it. But I know at the same time, other players are going to find that challenging to be confronted with, and you always have to walk a very delicate line with that. And we'll talk a little bit about what are some of the ways that you walk that delicate line, how do you deal with that? Um, whether it's about sexuality, race, ethnicity, gender roles. So, practical approaches. How do you deal with all this stuff? First, I would say, know what you want to do. Okay? Know what you want to do. I think that in any game, whether you're on a historical mark or any other kind of mark, okay, player communication is key. You want to tell your players what they can expect out of the game. And I've never been a big fan of bait and switch larks. I think it's really important that you, from the get go, you're very clear with the players about what they can expect in every aspect of the game, so they know whether this is a game that they want to devote time and energy to playing. But it's important for you, as a game designer, to know what you want so that you can communicate that effectively to your players. So, as I was sitting here and thinking about this, thought, well, what are some of the various ways in which you do history and watch. And I think there's sort of a spectrum that emerged in my mind. And I think it might be useful to just sort of lay that out and talk a little bit about it. On one end of the spectrum, you've got what I call reenactment. And that is when you take a historical event and you faithfully walk through it. SCA is a lot like that. Civil War reenactors. In Great Britain, they've got English Civil War reenactors who will, you know, we're going to recreate the Battle of Town. You are this pikeman, and your job is to stand there, and when the sun gets to that point behind that tree, and that flag over there starts to move, you're going to take 20 steps, that fellow is going to fire off his fake arbicus, and you fall down. Because that's where we found the body on the field when the archaeologists did their dig 25 years ago, and we know that's where you fell. Um, most of the time when we're talking about LARP in terms of running a game, that's not what we're talking about. But I do think it's important to know that that is one end of the spectrum over here. Maybe you've got what, we call rec what I call recreations. And this is when the game setting is a historical event, but the players can change the outcome. Uh, the Waltz of Nations game that Sydney and I ran at the Congress of Vienna is a good example of that. Everything up until the beginning of the Congress of Vienna had happened. Napoleon had risen to power after the French Revolution. He'd won all these battles. He'd invaded Russia. That had been, indeed, still a very bad idea. He retreated back across Europe. He had had the Battle of Leipzig. He'd been defeated. He'd been exiled to Elba. Everyone's meeting with that piano. And that's where history stops. And everything that happened after that happened based on what the players did. And it looked way different than the <laughs> It really did. It looks tremendously good. They can be given the players the agency to make the changes that we want. We, you want. Brazil is laughing hilariously. Yeah. She ended up marrying the king of Prussia. The king of Prussia did not actually marry her. Yes. Prince's migration, you probably don't have never heard of her. She's a real person. She was not someone who had the sort of reputation that would put her on the short list of good brides for the king of Prussia. <laughs> Historically. Just saying. But it happened through gameplay, and so in our world, the King of Prussia ended up much more closely aligned to the Russian Empire because he had married one of the Tsar's kinswoman, a particularly sketchy kinswoman. So the Tsar was actually kind of grateful that she'd been taken off his hands and placed in such a happy position, and it was hilarious and a lot of fun. Um, so that's another way you do it. You can also do a game which is what I call a purity piece. Which means the game setting is a historical time is in a historical time period, but it's not an actual historical event. Our princess in the town of murder mystery was like that. King Henry VII never actually held a party, you know, in which he, you know, commissioned some of the attendees there to look into the murder of his two kinsmen that we know of. Um, but that's what we how we set the game. So in a period piece, you can say, well, I want this game set in the Roaring Twenties. I want to set it during the French Revolution. I want to set it in the waning days of the Roman Republic. I want to set it at the court of Charlemagne. But you don't necessarily then have to 
located at a particular specific historical event. You simply then create an event yourself at which it happens and let the players go. And they live in that historical setting. And then at the far other end of the spectrum is probably where most games actually live in terms of a historical setting, which is the anthropological usage. And I really struggled with that last term, and I hate it, and it was just the kind of thing that was late at night, and I needed to get this PowerPoint finished, and I said, fine, it's anthropological usage, and I'll explain what I mean by that. This is when the game setting is not historical. It could be a fantasy setting. It could be a post-apocalyptic setting. It's a setting that you create for yourself that doesn't actually map to recorded actual history, but the designer wants to import certain game mechanic phenomena so that that looks and feels historically. Like I want my world to have serfdom. And I want that to fit and work historically accurately. I want the kings in my world and the queens in my world to have a sort of itinerant elective kingship like they did in the early Holy, Holy Roman Empire. I want there to be, you know, I want there to be colonies, and I want that to feel a little bit like 15th, 16th century Europe. Or I want there to be a warrior aristocracy that feels a little bit like Japanese Bushido or something like that. But the game world itself will be somewhat different. Maybe those serfs are all, you know, a different race, they're all the dwarves or the slaves or something like that. Um, so those are all different ways that you can sort of use history in the game, know what you're doing and communicate that effectively to the players so that they know what to expect. And I think that that's a really important first step. Now, how do you handle your players' intimidation and enthusiasm? And I think that this is something where I actually have some things to do. The first is, it's a delicate balance. You want to give them enough information that they feel like they've got a good handle on things. You don't want to give them a book. You don't want to sort of say, here's the background guide for the game, and drop the OED in front of them. They're just going to look at that, and they're going to go, no. So websites are always great. Um, when we were running our games, this was kind of a new thing. I, I'm, not at all. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot of, I should be doing this on an iPad, I should be doing this on my phone, I'm not really going to so look all cool in the 21st century and web 2.0. Give, give, give them websites, give them handouts, give them history lessons. Meet with players at various times, just talk to them, give them the option, give them the opportunity to learn about things just verbally from you. A lot of events, as a school teacher, I can tell you that different people learn in different ways. And so, if you want to convey information to people, you want to make sure that you've got it in small enough and digestible enough bits that they can take it all in, and that you're giving them enough different opportunities to get this information in different ways so that you can actually you know, get someone who's a visual one. Someone's like, well, I really am better if I just hear it from you. I really just want images. Some people are just like, just give me five links and I'll go and do the research myself. However you want to do it. The most important thing I would say is stick to the essentials. For every page of stuff you're going to give to the players, you should probably be condensing down five to ten pages of background stuff in the mouth. You know, give them the essentials of what they need because you don't want to burn them down. There are going to be some players who on their own are going to want more. And you have the other stuff that you can give them. But you don't want to overwhelm them with too much information at first. Um, also, you can have a variety of different levels of involvement. I think this is really important when you're running a historical game, is to bear in mind that different people are going to have different comfort levels and different areas of involvement, and so you can vary the historical involvement based on the rules available. If you want to run a game where there's going to be a lot of real heavy politics, and that if you want to take a real political role, you're going to have to absorb a good amount of historical knowledge. You make sure that there are other roles that are more timeless. Um, a good example is, again, you know, in Waltz and Patients, we had roles where we literally said, you are Castlereagh, you are the Russian ambassador, you are Hardenstadt, the German ambassador, you are Metternich. One of my friends played Metternich, he knew 
great if I knew. But I also gave him a briefing that was like 14 pages long. Because, and I said, if you're going to be Mennonite, you're setting yourself up to have to absorb a lot of information. And he's like, do it for me. Other people said, I don't really know a lot about history. I'm not really interested in digging into all of these different political sort of things. Okay, cool. You're a nobleman, you know, you're a nobleman's daughter and you need to get married by the end of this conference. Here's a list of single men. Go. <laughs> and here's the things you know about them that are good, here's the things you know about them that are bad, and here are some people that you might want to talk to to find out whether what I'm telling you is true or not in game. So you can vary these roles. We have another person who's like a jewel thief. Being a jewel thief doesn't necessitate that you understand the intricacies of the Polish question and whether or not Poland should remain an independent country after the Congress of Vienna, I said. Right? Um, and remember also, not everybody knew everything back then, just like today. How many of, how many of you watch those like, you know, late night TV shows and they like go out onto the streets of LA and they ask, they hold up a picture of, you know, you know, Supreme Court Justice, you know, John Roberts, who's this? And they go, uh. It was just as bad in the 1800s. It was just as bad. It was worse in the Middle Ages. I mean, you know, that line from Monty Python, how do you know that man's the king? He's, not, he's the one not covered in shit. That's, that's really true. <laughs> no one knew who the king looked what the king looked like unless you were personally associated with the king. So there were vast stretches of the population whose historical knowledge of the time period was extremely limited. So when you are running a game with historical elements to it, it's, I think it's important to also have some perspective and to know not everyone in the game, not all the characters in the game are going to have a clear idea of what's going on. I mean, my job as a historian would be a lot more boring, perhaps non-existent, if everyone in the past knew everything that had been going on. I mean, the only interesting stuff happens because people have no clue. So when you're writing games and when you're determining characters, I guess some of it is, it's okay to have people who aren't going to know the first thing about the historical background, who aren't going to know that, because there were people like that actually in history. And lastly, how do you keep people in games? One thing we found was really a great way to bring people into the game is to give them stuff to do. It's, it's, it's obvious, right? I mean, one of the most important things you're running is you need to give your players things to do. But sometimes the fact of the matter is, is they're not going to be able to go and talk with this particular person at this time. You're not going to have them on. So what are some things you can do that are good activities for the players and at the same time are going to be historically engaging to them? We found it was really cool to have period activities, to research what did people actually do to pass the time at a party in Vienna in the 18th century? One of the things they did is they played cards. They played a lot of cards. So we had card games at a lot of parties. We taught everyone to play whist, which takes about 10 minutes. It is literally one of the easiest games ever. Because, you know, really, really complicated games that require a lot of investment, European aristocrats on the whole don't want to spend all that time. So they want to play a relatively easy game. You can teach them how to dance. Dancing is great. When you want to have a private conversation with someone, what's This gives players things to do without actively pursuing their goals. I have to talk to Metternich. Metternich is talking to the czar. I am not going to go elbow in on the czar. I have to wait for Metternich to be done talking to the czar. So you can have two options. You can have the players sit there and just go. Or they can go play whist. Or they can go dance. I think the second option gives them better options, and it also allows them to still feel like they're in a historical time period. Um, the other thing I, we did, which we found really important, was what we call in-game guides. That is a picture of Prince Esther Hazel. <laughs> you laugh. Um, in Walt's Invasions, uh, a game I'm leaning very heavily on from my experiences here. I've run other games, but this one was just so awesome. Um, 
Cynthia and I played Prince and Princess Esterhazy, who were two of the biggest society hosts in all of Vienna. And what we told our players is that in this game, I don't know whether or not Prince Esterhazy was a really nice guy. I have no idea whether he was friendly and gregarious and open to everyone. I don't. But I made the decision that in this game, Prince Esterhazy was the nicest guy you would ever hope to meet. He'll talk to anybody about anything. And he would never think badly of you if you were revealed any sort of ignorance about who was who or social customers, social norms. And his wife, Princess Esterhazy, is just as nice. And what we told the players then, look, if you have any kind of questions or you forgot who someone is, you're not really sure about where the Prussians stand on whether there should be an independent Poland, you aren't really sure about how to properly address the Dowager Countess of Grantham or whatever, <laughs> go find Prince or Princess Esther Hazy, sidle up to them, exchange a little bit of small talk, ask them your question, and they will give you the answer. And that happens in-game. By having those in-game NPCs there to guide the players, they can go up to people, they can sort of go off and say, hey, can you remind me about this thing? And then you cue them a little bit on what they need to do, and it's all in character. And then they go off, and you can sort of send them off on their way. It's also a great way, well, I need to go talk to the czar. Hey, look, there's Prince Esther Hazy over there by the punch bowl. Why don't I go over to him, and he can sort of re re help me review what I need to say to the czar. And then when I go over there, I'll know what I'm doing. So having NPCs, you know, I, I would suggest very strongly, if you're going to run a game like this, you or someone else who's on your staff who is really well versed in the historical background should have an NPC who's around whose job it is simply to talk to players, to cue them in, to remind them of what's going on. And really, I think that might not be bad advice for any game where there's like a really complicated background that you're creating and some new <laughs> players who might, you know, not be sure about things. To have someone always circulating around that they know they can go to with an in-game justification to sort of say, hey, can you remind me? about this thing, and they'll get that answer. I think it really makes new players feel more welcome, it makes them feel more confident, and it also, I think, allows you to preserve immersion. And if you're running a historical game, I think the preservation of immersion is really, really important. Now, let's talk a little bit about evoking the mood versus strict accuracy. And here again, I think the important thing is to communicate to your players what you want. Have an idea in your head, about what your image is, and then communicate that effectively to your players. So for costume, know what you want and know what you're willing to accept. And it might be that what you're willing to accept, I would recommend very strongly that you be a little, that you be very flexible. That does not mean jeans and a t-shirt. But we had one great player. Um, that was Castleberry. Oh, he was Wellington. Okay, so anyway, Ian was Wellington. So one of my friends played the Duke of Wellington. He did not have the first scrap of costume. He was a single guy. He couldn't sell a button. So for his birthday, my wife Cynthia made him a vest. It's a really nice black and yellow striped vest and looked really sharp. That was the only costume piece he had. He wore dark trousers, he wore a white button-down shirt, he popped the collar up like this, he wore a tie, sort of tied like a cravat. I showed him how to take a black skinny necktie and tie it like a cravat, and he looked amazing. With a vest that, have, that was purchased there, you could have done the same thing with a vest you could have found at a thrift store, a white collared shirt, because we knew that that's all we needed. Some people have really amazing, spectacular costumes, and for those people, we were grateful and grateful and grateful to them for giving us those great costumes. But if you have a few bell cows who have great costuming, as long as everyone else is evoking the proper mood, you'll be fine. Um, one of my friends just wore a tuxedo to the game. A modern tux like you get in a rental store. But he was giving the mood that this is a formal occasion of sophisticated, high-end people. And that was all we needed. Came in the Merman Empire, 
go get some old bed sheets. Okay? And, and, and belt it. There you go. That's a toga. You know? um, so just communicate to your players sort of what the minimum standard is. And I recommend you keep it relatively low. And then have some people who you can lean on who are going to do bigger and better things costume-wise. And the fact of the matter is that's where people's eyes are going to be drawn. People are going to be looking at the person in the ball now, the person in the historically accurate, you know, 18th century cut tail coat. And everyone else has just got to, you know, there's enough there that you realize, oh yes, there's a high standing collar and he's got sort of a cravatty thing going on. Oh look, there's a vest. As long as there's nothing jarring to break that immersion, as long as you just have a few anchor points, everything else is just going to go along. And if you communicate that effectively to your players, everyone's going to feel really good. Language is another one. And here again, I think it's great to communicate to players a few slang words from the time period, give them maybe two or three things. And I don't think it's, a, you, you definitely want, it's too much to ask for everyone to immediately take on every aspect of the patterns of speech of an earlier time period. In part, because we don't know. We don't know what people sounded like in the court of Charlemagne. We don't know what those were. We know what some of the literate people wrote in writing. But how did that tr translate to how they communicated to each other verbally? No idea. Anybody who tells you they know what Julius Caesar sounded like is trying to sell you something. We have some ideas, but we don't know. So, what I typically tend to do is I say, here's three or four things that you can give to people and say, I'm going to ask you to do two things. Avoid this list of three or four words as much as possible. Try to include these three or four words as much as possible. And if you can say, instead of this, say that, instead of this, that, two or three times. And again, if you have those little cues that's going to create, it's like having the costuming piece here, 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 and here. If you can have four or five people saying these same common phrases, that's going to sort of allow you, allow people to overlook, it's going to cancel out the times people say, that's really cool. Instead of, that's splendid, or remarkable. Um, if you do, and again, if you have people who are very talented linguistically, who are actors, who are good with accents, who can give you a little bit more of that verbal support, lean on them and say, hey, you know, I'm going to count on you a little bit to kind of cover that. And sometimes it can be different people. If you've got someone with a great costume over here and you get someone else who's an actor who's just sort of in a vest with a white, with a white button down shirt over here, but the person who is the actor is speaking in what really sounds like great 18th century period dialect. That's another huge advantage. Um, so again, lean on the player's strengths, costuming, language, whatever it is that they can bring to the table, encourage them to bring that to the table. And if everybody is doing one little thing, it's going to create a better setting for everybody. And then finally, scenic NPCs. If you have some people on your staff who you can get costumed up, if you have some people on your staff who you can get trained up in how to speak properly, you can roll them in and they're going to just help raise everything for everybody. So I guess when I'm talking about strict accuracy, my take on it, my experience has been it's not necessary. It's just going to scare people away. And you're better off having a lower bar of entry and then relying on certain people to exceed that mark. And that's just going to raise things generally for everybody. And everybody's then going to have a better time. The people who have the spectacular costumes or have the linguistic fluency or have a little piece of historical knowledge are going to feel great and special to be able to help the game. And then other people who maybe are lacking in some area or another aren't going to feel bad because they're certainly not going to be alone. Now, this is the last thing, and I have about 15 minutes left. So this is something that is the biggest, most difficult thing is problematic values and attitudes. How do you deal with the fact that ideas about gender, ideas about sexuality, ideas about race in earlier historical time periods were often very different from what we have now? The 
the first and most important thing is to communicate effectively with your players. This is an area where I think it's really important to be very open with your players, to tell them what you're expecting, what is okay, and what is not okay. Um, when, you know, there are going to come times when players are going to say, I want to be a ninja. But this is a game set in, you know, true strong. We, we, don't, we don't have ninjas. So when you talk about them, like, what, what do you mean when you say, I want to be a ninja? And they, they probably don't necessarily mean I am absolutely dead set on being a semi-mythical Japanese assassin dressed in black. They want their character to be able to do certain things and to have a certain vibe and to fill a certain role in the game. And if you can communicate with them about that, find out what you want and say, okay, well, they don't have ninjas, but here's what a ninja would be. Here's what they would call what we call a ninja, and this is the role you would play. You could be a cup coach. You could be the, you could be the slightly shady retainer of the Duke of Norfolk, who we know is a slightly shady guy. And yes, you're coming in, and you're not going to be as well dressed as some of the other people. You're going to be in more sort of subtle colors, and you're going to stick to the shadows a little bit, and you're probably going to have other things that you need to do, more of a spy kind of thing. So I think it's best always not to say, no, you can't be a ninja. What do you think? There's no ninjas. And instead say, okay, well, what, you, what I think you mean by that is this other thing, and here's how we can work it in, and here's how it fits within the history. Because one of the things that I found is that people, I think, tend to underestimate the variety of different roles that were available in actual history. Our picture of how history actually worked in LARP was, in, in, in reality, was sometimes limited. And use your knowledge to help the players get to where they want to go rather than being restricted and saying, you can't do this. I think it's always important for the history to encourage the players to give them a good time rather than the other way around. Um, So, the last piece I want to talk about is how do you deal with the problems of, you know, things like race, gender, sex roles. Some of it, I think, is you need to figure out what do you want to do with the game. And my feeling is that player comfort and player, players feeling safe, that has to come absolutely first. I would never want a player to feel uncomfortable in a game in the nature of historical accuracy, that's just not. So communicate with your players about what their comfort level is. Um, think also about how much compromise the setting can reasonably take. Uh, for example, I think if you're running a game with Boffer Combat, everyone's there because they want to do Boffer Combat. And it's going to be very difficult to run a game like that with strictly historical gender roles. <laughs> That's just the way it is. So I would say in that case, what goes out the window? Telling half your player base they don't get to swing phone? Or saying that particular historical reality has to go out the window? In that case, I'd say that historical reality has to go out the window. Um, in a theater style of the game, I think you can be a little bit more you can be a little bit more historically accurate. But, you know, for example, in the case of gender roles, I think we have a tendency to view that in very absolutist and modern terms. So, you know, if a female, if a female player were to say to me, hey, I want to be a political mover and shaker, I would say, okay, wait, here are, here's how you do that as a woman in the Middle Ages. You don't say, oh no, women did, because that's not true. We know where political movers take takers in the Middle Ages all the time. Say, guess what? You could be, I'll tell you what, I'll write you a role as the abbess of Quedlinburg. You're the king's aunt, and you're the abbess of this monastery, and you have 1,500 knights under your control. And you tell them where to go. Mm -hmm. Cool, right? Because that's historically the case. That's how it actually worked. Um, I think a lot of our perceptions about gender roles 
sex roles, racial roles, tend to be, history is much more complicated, I think, than pop culture often lets on. And if you allow history to be complicated, you're going to be able to accommodate your players. I wanted to step, end uh, a little early. I will say that if, this, if it goes well, I know there are some specific areas that I haven't talked about. I recognize this was very general. If this goes well, I may do next year do something on a more specifically focused theme. Or not. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, but um, I did want to spend some time for any questions, commentary, discussions. If, Seven o'clock rolls around and someone else has to come in. We can barricade the door and <laughs> <laughs> the tables. We can set up. Hey, sir, right? Sorry. There's another. Sorry. There's another way to handle gender roles without the gender roles. Which I personally have done, and maybe not all the females are are comfortable with this. But um, for a uh, a um, uh, Napoleonic era uh, naval game, I swapped genders. I was a, a, a lieutenant, so I made myself a, a tail coat, a blue tail coat, and I dressed up. As a male character, that's another way to handle it. Roselle actually played my first option. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, so yes, gender you know, allowing allowing women to play male characters is always on. And I think, as a general rule, I don't think there should ever be any restrictions on that in terms of a game. If a woman came to me and said, "I want to play a male character," I'd say, "Great, stand it up." Um, if a guy came to me and said, "Hey, you know, I think it'd be interesting to play a female character," I'd say, "Great, stand it up." And there shouldn't be any issues with that at all. But yes, that's thing. But you know, some people want to play a female character or a male character, and they want to be able to take an unconventional role. And especially in a buffer mark, I think, where you can say, well, you know, it's, it is historically true that women tended not to do fighting. That's not going to work. So but historically, there is evidence that there were some females that did participate, especially Yes. And the Civil War, and you can say, this isn't probably a new thing. There's probably women who can pass with men, and they wouldn't pass. Mm -hmm. right. just, they never got caught. Like, like women who just cut teams. their hair and light. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, definitely, there's plenty of ways you can handle it. Emily? Um, so let's say you want to do a LARP that's like uh, exploring issues of race mm -hmm. and racial tension. Um, do you, what do you think about, like, uh, you know, I assume you would tell all of your playmates ahead of time, this is what we're exploring, if you're on right. the don't come. Um, but, like, let's say you want to explore slavery during the Civil War or something, um, you don't have any black players, or, you know, things like that. How do you recommend addressing things like that? I think the very first thing is to be very clear with the players about what you're getting into. Um, I think a game like that, I think any game that explores those sorts of tensions is best done in a limited, I mean, Serfdom the LARP is probably best as a one shot. <laughs> I do not think that that has the legs for a campaign style game. Um, it would be a very, very sad bleak <laughs> style game. Okay, are, are we, we going to run the famine mod? Right. Which, which famine mod? <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, the, the broader issue of race and LARP in terms of, you know, having uh, players of color in your game and the extent to which LARP is kind of white as, a, as an activity uh, is, is a bigger issue. Um, I think it's all about player comfort. Uh, that would require a lot of... Uh, it would require a lot of communication with the players. I think something like that, I would feel most comfortable in abstracting it a step, um, because some of those, some people still have very raw feelings about some of those issues. Like doing the anthropological usage, you know, like this is the theory, this is what we're doing, yeah. but it's not actual race or gender. Yeah, it's I that think issue. I think the issue, I mean, I think it's, it would be really fascinating to explore a game where there was sort of like an issue of an apartheid establishment, an issue of race based slavery. Um, but actually, being really historically accurate about that, I think would, that is such a hot button issue. Personally, I would feel 
I would not feel well equipped to navigate that particular thing in a way that I could guarantee that everyone would feel comfortable with it and leave having had a good experience. It's fine, just let them play it over the one more specific headband it's for the reason. Clearly, that's totally not offensive. <laughs> Nobody can possibly be upset. But to, I mean, taking it back a step, maybe maybe adding a level of abstraction and allow you to explore that really important concept while sort of insulating people from the more immediate problems. I think, I think you joked about the headbands. I think it actually would be interesting if you did a scenario that was like that. If it were the point of the game. But yes. instead, yes. make it so that instead of the actual race, change it to be, oh, the people wearing these headbands represent this fictitious right. race. Yeah. Yeah. Play the scenario yeah. out and see how they feel about it. After. Right. There have been, you know, you could, you could do it by a lot of things. You do it by eye color, you do it by hair color. I mean, in react, and actually that might be an interesting approach because if you look back historically, race is really socially constructed. And we make, we have made choices, that we have made a choice as a society to, sure, thanks for coming. Yeah, sorry, to, to make certain physical traits meaningfully different, whereas other historical traits are not meaningfully different. Why is, why is skin color so important, as opposed to hair color, as opposed to eye color, as opposed to any, a lot of other things, as opposed to height or anything like that, right? So that's just socially constructed, and maybe just tweaking it a little and saying, okay, well, in this scenario, it's eye color. You know, us blue-eyed people, you know, are being, or us blue-eyed people have it bad. Um, you know, those brown-eyed people keep us down. Um, so maybe that's how it worked, or you could twist it around the other way around if you wanted to play a game where there were, you had a situation where you had sort of a minority cultural elite. You know, you can play with the, you can play with the statistics a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it is interesting, I think, to know that if you think, if you look at ancient descriptors of race, how the Romans talk about people of different nationalities, they didn't have the same category as we do. And those categories are of relatively recent vintage. Yeah. Cultural appropriation is not as old as any form that has historical elements of non white cultures getting a lot of crap from people uh, either not being sensitive and kind of taking a stereotype or mm -hmm. meaning well but still somehow I mean how like how, how would you play Native American? Part, yeah. Right. You wanted to have that sort of I want to have Native Americans in my world or I want to have, yeah. you know, um, Asians and you know Japanese, you know, people who are very similar culturally to Right. You know, uh, and and how do you do that without, without, with how do you do that with and, and, and avoiding that sort of sense of cultural appropriation? Without, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is again that that's yeah, a real mind game. Stand up. I think there was a panel about that particular subject this weekend. Was there really? I think there was. Yeah. So. I I think the biggest thing again is that is an area where there's going to be a tremendous amount of education done with your players. And a player, it's in a way I would say that the bar has to be pretty high for a player who wants to take on a role like that. They have the responsibility to do a lot of research and to communicate pretty effectively with you uh, as a GM to ensure that they're doing it in a way that everyone they need is going to be comfortable with. Um, and it's like, you know, my friend who said, I want to play. Prince Metternich, and I said, you know, you're going to get a 14-page brief, right? I'm going to strictly absorb all that. And he's like, I'm, I'm a junior associate in a law firm, so yes, I think I can absorb 14 pages without learning things. So I'm like, great, you're in. Um, same sort of thing I'd say. You know, it's, there's, there's going to be, I think you set the bar a little higher. Um, I just want to jump on that. I think one of the ways to do that is um, if you're talking about, like, uh, a certain trying to appropriate a certain culture rather than talking about result oriented things like this is how they behave.
talk about these are their values. Yes. Because values is societal, and you know you can say, well, this culture values loyalty, and there's a lot of different ways to value loyalty that aren't stereotypical. Um, so that's a, a way I think to get around like creating character types and and you know being basically sort of unintentionally racist. You just let people decide what that value means to them, but it's still representative of the values that. I'm also a little, I'm always a little weary of uh, cultural shorthand because I do think it tends to run into the danger of falling into stereotypes so quickly. So I, if I was running a game where I wanted to have a, a culture in the game that was like Native American culture, I would try to find a different way to describe that other than using the words like Native American culture because that's that's a shorthand that I think encourages stereotyping and instead you can say this is and, and also you know, if you think about it what is what does Native American culture mean? I mean is, is that like saying Asian culture I mean or African culture or European culture I mean you know you've got um, you've, got, you've, you've got some, you've got some, you know, Native American tribes that were mostly settled and engaged in, 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 in sort of garden-style agriculture. You had some that were semi-nomadic, you know, horse riding, you know, hunter-gatherers. You had others that were more sort of sedentary hunter-gatherers that didn't have domesticated horses. So think about what you want that group to look like. And then actually say this is what they like. This is a nomadic culture that uses horses to hunt large game, and a lot of their ceremonies and culture are, you know, around, are centered around that sort of thing. Am I? Am I there is somebody directly behind you, so if you want to go a little bit over, you can totally go. Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. So that that'd be my advice on that. Yeah, I'm sure that's all. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say really briefly that those are probably really good ways to mitigate it, but I don't think there's a way to guarantee that anyone's ever going to be offended. So yeah. I, those are probably really good ideas. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a guarantee, so I think you just have to be careful and communicate with people. Yeah, and I think at the same time, there's. You want to be fun for all the players. And I think that if you, from the beginning, create a culture and set an expectation, the communication between players and the game staff is, is cool and is, and is expected, and you keep those lines of communication open, then you're going to avoid a lot of problems because people will feel comfortable expressing how they feel early, and that prevents problems from festering. So. Okay. I also met you. But no, I mean, you, I think that's a really good question. <laughs> yes? Yeah, um, I'm going to comment. Right. I, I, I don't think we've had too many problems with that, but I think we should have some interesting things. 
Mm -hmm. costume yeah. discovery yeah. sort of stuff. I think that I didn't address this a little bit as, as somebody who makes really great costumes and then people look at me and go, oh, I can never make a costume like that. I, I don't look down on people who can't. As long as you try, I think that's great. If yes. you have zippers on your boots, I don't care. You have great boots. You got the boots you could get. Um, if you want to go whole hog and get boots without zippers or whatever, you know, as far as you feel you can go, I'm fine with that. But I think there just needs to be a clear literature of everybody has different ability and budgets and just to kind of set, set that tone for the players to say, yeah. you know, try your best to ignore uh, things that are sort of not conducive, you know, in the setting too. I mean, we're all going to ignore uh, <coughs> certain things that people's houses have, like electric lighting. Uh, and That's what I'm saying. You don't, you don't have the time limit. There's nobody after you. We're, we're going to ignore those okay. things. We're going to suspend our disbelief about that, right. those things. <laughs> so let's suspend our disbelief about zippers. And no, that's, that's the know. attitude that I have. And you have a really good attitude. And I'm wondering how, um, like, because you guys have done some of these sorts of things. And is right. there any particular thing, a way that you prefer to sort of, um, well, yeah, convey this attitude to your players and tell them I, this I is think, attitude? Yeah, I think the best way to do this is, um, if the game materials specifically include tips for players to sort of say, here's here's how you can here's how you thrift shop your way to a historical look, mm -hmm. then I think it's harder for other players to kind of sneer at that if the game staff is saying it's okay and it's cool. Mm -hmm. um, Another way to do it, I think, is just be mindful, be encouraging of new players, and everyone is going to compliment the amazing looking costumes, and you absolutely should. But at the same time, I think if you take the time to, when you're welcoming new players, to have staff sort of take a little time to say, wow, hey, you know, I really appreciate you. You know, that's a really nice vest, but you know, you really, You've really done a great job of capturing the spirit here, kind of thing, and be encouraging to the new players who clearly don't have as much costuming. Then that, I think, sends a message to the other players in the game that the people running the game are happy that people are making the effort and that they should as well. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think communication goes both ways. If you do get any sense that you've got some people who are creating a negative vibe, in that way, then I don't think, I, I really think you cannot hesitate to take that player aside and simply say, I know someone like, I really appreciate all the effort you put into your costume, but um, please let's try to be encouraging to the other players who don't have the same skills and resources. Um, and if someone is going to get their nose bent out of shape by that, then um, I hate to be exclusionary, but at the same time, uh, then you may have nipped a bigger problem in the butt yeah. at that point and done yourself a favor in the long term. Because someone who is going to A, be disdainful of other people's efforts, and B, get defensive and get their nose out of joint if they're, you know, respectfully asked to be more encouraging, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a person who in the long run is going to be someone who would be bringing positive energy. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to take a real quick survey here. Um, if I did something like this next year, are there some specific areas in LARP, like economic systems, or systems of social hierarchy, or ways in which people organize themselves politically, or warfare, that you would like to hear more in detail about? I want to do things that you want to hear, so. All of them. All of them. All of them. All of them. Yeah, they're all. Okay, so like, all of them. Uh -huh. I mean, not necessarily all of them next year, but. All of them next year. Yeah. <laughs> be, I want you to build a four hour block of time. <laughs> but to, yeah, any, I would love to do any one of those. Thank you to really focus in on this one thing how to make a really historically accurate economic system. From you know uh, Greece, right? Greek economic system, or um, Egyptian.
Egyptian egg on like a very specific thing or for social or for the warfare, whatever. Grace, could you do a social, political kind of you know, social and go through the major ones that would give different examples? Would that be something you could do? Useful. I mean, I think if I was going to do one on economic systems, I would probably necessarily have to mix in the social hierarchy structure yeah. anyway because any, my sense is that any non-modern economic system where um, labor and the transfer of wealth is done in a way other than a modern transactional method depends on social connection. You know, I mean, there's a lot of different ways in which, in which societies organize their economies before the modern era. People work for things other than a fair wage. Um, you know, those pyramid builders weren't slaves, but they weren't getting paid much more than you know the beer that kept them going either. So why did they do it? Well, that is a very interesting question, and <laughs> and I'm already running late. Um, so you know, but so if you're going to talk about how do you organize labor and production and things like that in a non-modern, non not in a non-modern context. You also have to understand how the social structures work because those two are very closely intertwined. Yeah, I can see that. Cool. Yeah. Okay, what are we going to do it next? Okay. Woohoo! Another free con badge! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, there is a, uh, there's a game at 8 that I have promised to NPC. Yes! yes. So, so, thank you so much for coming over. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this. So, I was necessarily somewhat nervous. I hope it was okay and that you got some interesting ideas. If you if you got any sort of general ideas that are going to help you go out and create better larks for people, then I'm really happy with that. I really want you to do that circle every week. There's a project that's doing too much. That's running out in Okay. It's basically taking all the different groups from that area. When you sign up, you sign up for the various states, Roman or Saxon. That's really cool. They're actually trying to sort of help. Well, they're trying to, they're trying to see, it's obviously not a company that's very accurate, but they're trying to see how they interact with racial packages, cultural packages for each of the sections of the players. Oh, neat.